everyone for coming. Um, it's nice to see so many of you, and I know some of you have travelled a bit to get here, so appreciate that. Um, um, as as Sheila said, my name is Rosie Irwin, so I'm the Senior Engagement Officer for Butterfly Conservation in Northern Ireland. Um, my role is to do exactly this, to outreach to new people, to talk to people about butterflies and moths, um, to encourage folks to record butterflies and moths that they see, um, and I do also do work with partners and community groups and schools and that sort of thing. Um, so today is specifically about the butterflies and moths of the Morns. So Butterfly Conservation, founded in 1968, uh, we are about the conservation of butterflies, moths and their environment. Um, we take practical conservation action, promote scientific study, um, safeguard important sites and then encourage, obviously, yourselves to enjoy butterflies and moths and the reasons why. So butterfly conservation formed through volunteers, um, like lots of organizations, but without them, that it, it wouldn't have existed. So it just started with folks who were interested in recording um, butterflies and moths that they saw, and then they came together and formed, uh, eventually formed a charity. Um, so without the volunteers, we would not exist, basically. Uh, so on the top kind of left corner here, you can see a work party. So we would go out in the wintertime a lot of the time to manage um, special sites for butterflies and moths. Uh, you can join on any of those um, if you'd like to. Um, top right is a community association allotment that I went out to and they have started making um, butterfly moth boxes where it's like a simple um, planter box where you can put in a few different species of plants that will attract a variety of moths and butterflies and caterpillars to complete that life cycle um, process. We do lots of moth trapping um, events um, recording then and these bottom two right hand photographs is going out and actually surveying for butterflies um, and then you can do specific trapping for, for moths as well and then this is a, a, a different kind of survey it's called a wider countryside butterfly survey which is a square basically a randomized square throughout Northern Ireland that you can pick and you can go and walk um, twice a year it's not much but Imagine a nice sunny day, go for a walk, count butterflies, what could be better? So um, that's another way that um, our volunteers help in terms of um, data and understanding what we have here. So Lepidoptera means scaly wings. I don't know if you saw that picture there that came up. So if you've ever accidentally caught a butterfly or touched a butterfly, you look at your hands and it's all dusty. Those are the scales that come off um, on your hands. Um, and they need those to fly, obviously. Approximately 180,000 species worldwide, roughly about 27, give or take a few migrants, are found in Northern Ireland. And then it's about 34, roughly, give or take migrants across the island of Ireland. Um, a migrant species you can see here, Painted Lady. Um, so it'll come, and it'll come in, in, in big fluxes. Sometimes we'll get a Painted Lady year, where people report like hundreds of them lots and lots and lots in their gardens. And that's just a kind of a natural population fluctuation. And they actually fly from um, South America um, to come here, um, which is pretty amazing. So here's one that you probably will recognize, um, but you have seen it's an early spring butterfly. And it's an indicator of the sort of beginning of, of spring. Uh, phenology is really what they call it, where we're looking at those shifts in, in, the, in the seasons. And once you see uh, orange tip butterfly, that's a good sign. And the same with things like when your blackthorn comes into blossom. So there's just signs of spring um, coming. Um, the males are very distinctive. Obviously they have the orange tips. The females sadly do not. <laughs> so they are a little bit more challenging uh, to recognize. That's the caterpillar. Top right, if you can see that is its food plants. That's cookie flower. It also feeds on sweet rocket um, and honesty, which are both really easy plants to grow in your garden. Um, cookie flower you have seen probably growing along sort of road birds and stuff. And it's really nice to see that, that um, roads have sort of reduced their cutting regime. So I hope they get a chance if possible uh, before it gets cut to, to get into that caterpillar stage. And a few years ago now, somebody showed me that you can find the eggs, that tiny, tiny little orange egg. And it's pretty amazing. It's a really cool thing to do with kids. Just kind of bend back to the flower and have a look. And I mean, it's, just, it's tiny, it's about a millimeter. 
in size, but it's a, you know, it's a really, it kind of shows how vulnerable they are and, and, and how small they are and um, in terms of that kind of life cycle um, that they go through. So the whites then, just briefly, which you will probably have seen lots of. Oh, didn't mean to do that, sorry. Um, yeah, lot, I've seen lots of, um, no, that's gone funny now, sorry, oh God. Um, okay. Right, how do I get it back? Presentation, anybody? Is that a good one? Do they smoke? Mm. No, no, I just hit the wrong one. It's, it's hidden by the, yeah. the tab. Just go to presentation. Yeah, it's gone into note mode now. Can I see that? Okay, great. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's get back to where I was. So apologies, this slide is on a timer, so I need to pause it and accidentally. Okay, so you'll have seen lots of these. I've seen loads of small white and large white. To be honest, and die, they literally just look all the same, uh, which is very confusing. And even the experts still get confused um, because they, well, they do stop. Um, a good time to see them is early in the morning when they're basking. So like 10, 10, 30, as the temperature starts to increase and you will see them, they will stop and feed. Uh, and obviously to get that energy from the sun. Um, so top left is small white, or sorry, large white. Um, and it's distinctive, a way to remember is the L, L for large white, black lines here on both sides, the apex of the wing. So that's a really easy way to remember that one. And it is much bigger, it's sort of floppy and you know, you can tell you may well see it in conjunction with a small white or green veined white as well. Um, over to the right then a small white and it has much less of the black. I sort of referred to that as like a wedge of T's on the end um, of the wing. And so it does not create that L shape. Um, so remember that. Plus it has lovely, you can't see it in this picture, but it's lovely lemony color under wings and there are no veins. Once you see veins, you know it's the green veined white, okay? So those two always get mixed up. And it's mostly just because you're not seeing the right part of the butterfly. Plus it'll just whoosh past your head and you know, it's a flash of white and you're not, you're not gonna be sure what it is. Um, but but uh, green veined white does have a fairly distinctive flight pattern. It's sort of a bit mammoth and a bit crazy and kind of goes all over the place. Uh, whereas this, the large is that kind of slightly labored, much bigger, kind of slower flight. Then the female um, of the orange tip is on the bottom right. And she does still have that lovely kind of mossy mottled effect on her underwing. Like you saw in the previous photograph, it looks like some moss, like a kind of a greeny gray color. These are widely known as the cabbage whites, which you remember. Most people kind of refer to them as that. They will eat your brassicas, your broccoli. They annihilated my broccoli last year. But interestingly, it still came back. Um, so the caterpillars had, had their go and, you know, they kind of went into chrysalis and, and they were happy. But the broccoli did still come back again, which is quite interesting. Obviously, if you're a broccoli farmer, that's not going to work. But if you're an allotment holder and you're happy to wait, you can allow that kind of process to happen. Alternatively, you do companion planting, which any allotment holders will be aware of. So nasturtiums, they will feed on those um, and hopefully, you know, go on to that and you can pick them off or you can take off the, the eggs and stuff and kind of place them in, a, in, in that place. And then last but not least is cryptic wood white, um, which is a very interesting little butterfly. It's not 
does not feed on brassicas. It feeds on um, meadow vetchling. You can see in the photograph here on the right hand side, and there's a lovely picture of it on some ragged robin there. Um, it's in, G in UK, it's only found in Northern Ireland. It's not found in, in the rest of the UK. So we do actually get like ecotourism for this butterfly. People want to come over and find it and look for it. Um, we still don't have enough records or understand enough about it in terms of its life cycle process, um, uh, you know, wh where it might like to, to pupate, for example. Um, so the more we find out about it, the better. It's also associated with urban sites a lot of the time. So like a brownfield site where some of it's waiting for planning to happen and you get a sort of scrubby um, stuff growing and it's often been found there. Um, and it has been seen in, in this area. I think it's more widespread than we, than we think, but one of the best places to go and view it um, is Craig Avon Lakes, um, which is uh, ABC Council uh, area, but uh, it has been it's seen here as well. And it's been found on, on Murloc and, and in around this area too. So the browns then, um, this is just some of the browns, the browns as we call them. So all the species are kind of split up into groups. Um, top left is small heath, it's a lovely little butterfly. Um, its name is a little bit misleading. It doesn't necessarily only be found on heathland, we find on some different types of grassland. Um, there's lots seen on murloc um, up in, in the morns as well. Uh, ringlets on the right hand side, it's got these lovely distinctive little um, dots, little eye spots with the gold ring round. I've been to tropical um, forests and, and places and that morphology of butterfly is really quite common. I've seen different versions of that, so it's quite interesting. And you'll see clouds of those as they rest. They just look brown with a little kind of fawny kind of ring around the edges of, of its wings. Um, and we had loads of those last year. Uh, bottom left is meadow brown. I suppose the distinctive um, part of that would be those orange patches and then that little eye spot in the middle on the, on the top wings, the four wings. And then speckled wood, um, it's very shade tolerant, as its name suggests. It's quite happy to be in woodland shady areas, along kind of hedgerows, that sort of thing. Will come into your garden as well. And the males can be quite territorial, which is interesting, a bit like a kingfisher will. It'll fly along and stop and go back. And that's because it's reached the end of its territory. And speckled woods will do that too. You'll see the males fighting and sort of buzzing around each other and, uh, you can look out for that um, in the spring and summertime. Um, all the browns pretty much feed on different types of grasses. So if you have any, hence the no mow may and all these kind of different campaigns that are sort of ongoing to encourage us to cut less, uh, to mow less, to put away our mower. Um, but for these guys especially, um, and the likes of the, the orange tip that I mentioned before, so it allows those wildflowers to come through um, over time on these various different types of grasses. And it's the long kind of, it's the long meadow type grasses that, that they'll be interested in. And then some of the kind of coarser ones um, as well. There's a few other browns that I haven't mentioned that you guys have here. Um, this is the, the wall butterfly. So it's, it's fairly rare now, um, for whatever reason, you can see from that little map there, um, just about so the yellow is back in the sort of 70s to or to late uh, 1990s and then 2000 orange is 2000 to 2014 and then more recent is the red spot so you can sort of see how it's it's dropped and and, and gone into just a few locations and this is one of the, the places that you can still see it um it was last recorded 2021 near dundrum castle um, but before that, um, as Andy was, was assuring me, it, the best place was probably um, Sheetland's area near Ardglass. Um, at, that's an ASSI managed by uh, the Environment Agency. Um, and, and it has been, it was seen there fairly regularly, um, sort of back in that time. So, I mean, that's where volunteers come in. You know, if you happen to go out for a walk and you're looking for that particular butterfly, um, we, we do need folk to, 
to, to go out and, and see if they can see it. It's on the wing now. Um, you can see it now. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely butterfly. I've seen it in, in a spoffin in the west of Ireland, um, but not here. Um, and it seems to be pushed coastal. They're not 100% sure why that's happening, and it's happening in JV as well. Um, and they reckon it's something to do with climate change, but they haven't enough research yet to understand really what is going on. Um, but I think an all Ireland um, picture would be interesting to see on where is it still staying across the island and, and you know, what's happening in general um, would be good to understand. Another brown one then that you can see here feeds on different types of grasses, coarse grasses is the grayling. Um, and it has been seen in the morns. It's, it does look really very similar to the wall, to be honest. And it's really well camouflaged. You see in that bottom right hand photograph. Um, it's just, it's great at, um, at blending in. And I've seen it on Murloc um, on, on one of our kind of field trips. And even its caterpillar looks near nigh impossible to see. Um, caterpillars are pretty hard to find. Um, I find kids are better at finding them than, than I am. Um, and yeah, camouflage is great. Uh, so that's, that's one to look out for as well. And there is actually a, a transect that the National Trust walks specifically for um, this butterfly. To kind of zoom in on its numbers. Um, then migrants now that I talked about earlier in terms of the painted ladies. So there's the comma butterfly. This is facing loads down in this area. Um, in Morn Park, uh, in the Morns, uh, in Ross Trevor, I think as well. Um, you can see by the little pic the picture here, the little comma. That's where it gets, gets its name from. And it's an unusual butterfly. It looks like it's been damaged. And that sort of jaggedy edge is, is the way it's, it's normally meant to look. Um, and I've yet to see one of those. I've never seen a, a comma. Um, but I have to go to Moran Park <laughs> and have a look. So I, I call these the, the showy butterflies um, because uh everybody's seen these or likely to have seen them um but when their wings are closed they do look very deceivingly similar they almost look black and i've had emails from people i'm like i've seen a black butterfly it's like, mm, probably one of these um as they close their wings so small tortoise shell um a way to remember that is it does it can look similar to painted lady and some of these always, always look for the blue dots along the bottom of the wings. That is a surefire way that you will know that it's a small tortoise shell. And then obviously it has those lovely tiger stripes along the top. Um, we talked about the, the comma, which is on the right there. Uh, bottom left is Painted Lady. So I should have put the names in the pictures as opposed to the person who took the photograph. Um, uh, but so that's Painted Lady. Um, it does have tiger stripes too. So that, that's really similar to tortoise shell, small tortoise shell. We don't get a large tortoise shell. Some people write to me. I saw, no, 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 just a small, it's just a small. Um, but you can see there's no powder blue dots on the Painted Lady. And as its wings are shut, it does have um, like a nice kind of pinky color as well underneath. Uh, this guy is super distinctive, obviously because of the big eye spots, the peacock. Um, those are for defense, for scaring away birds and any other predators that looks like a, a pair, a set of a pair of eyes. And then lastly, the um, red admiral. So it's got that lovely red stripe, uh, no blue dots, big red stripes. And underneath they're like a pinky, salmony pinky color as it has its wings shut. These all feed on thistles or nettles. So again, it's that leave a little messy patch don't tidy too much, this sort of message that keeps being repeated. And, and, and that is why, um, because these, get, they, these are really, really important plants for a multitude of butterflies and a ton of other insects and moths as well. So the caterpillars will feed um, on those plants. So if you can, if you can leave a little patch, um, all the better for those. Next we have, I mean, Need I say more? I don't even need to talk. Like that butterfly is our largest butterfly. It's called the silver wash fritillary. It's just, it's stunning. Um, it's caterpillar is bizarre as well. And then even the underwing is really unusual with that kind of green pattern. Um, 
and you get like um like little dots and stuff along the edges here uh it's quite hard to tell the difference between the dark green patillary this one has seen been seen a lot in Morn Park as well um so much so we may consider doing a separate survey there potentially for it and it's associated with um woodland habitat older woodland habitat its food plant is like a, a violet a little purple violet and it tends to grow in kind of clearings and glades in the woodland and its nickname is the the wood the woodsman's or the woodman's friend or wood person's friend uh, because of that clearing or, or coppicing and using materials from from the woodland to create these glades then the food plant grows and then the butterfly comes in uh, so it's a really nice one dark green then you can see it's quite different underneath it doesn't have that green it's got these big white spots um, and there's almost like a double line of, of spots along the bottom it's not as big that doesn't help you so much though um, I've seen this in the Belfast Hills I've seen, seen it lots in Murloc um, and again it's um, it has a, a violet food plant and last but not least marsh fertility so uh, Murloc this area, Moorns in general, is one of the best strongholds for this butterfly. This is the only butterfly that has the highest protection that's European protected. Um, so if you, if you actually want to go out and survey, you have to, have to apply for a license. Um, so it's that highly protected. Um, it's associated with like wet kind of boggy ground, not always peatland, but it's sort of, but it, because of Murloc, it's interestingly found in these sort of um, uh, dune areas and different types of grasslands. And its food plant is, is specifically devil's bit scabious, which is, you'll have seen field scabious, which you buy in your garden center. It's a lovely lilac pom-pom. Field scabious is smaller and a deeper purple. And um, you'll see it kind of pop, pop, pop all over the place. Um, it's a lovely little flower. And a top right photo is its caterpillars and they kind of fold over the leaves down the bottom and spin away brown for protection. And then they kind of hatch inside and they stay in that web. One way of surveying for them, as you can see here in the top left photo, is to look for those webs, and that's around September time. So we're getting close to the kind of um, the, the web, the web count stage, uh, looking for those, and then you'll be able to estimate a population as we'll come out the next year. Um, and is it a viable population, and are they connected? And that's the problem with lots of these species. You might find them in one place, but there's nowhere else in the mind that it's suitable. It's a sink. It's called a sink in terms of populations. It's just going to collapse because it's nowhere to go. Species need to spread and need to move around. Um, so hence the sort of wildlife corridors, nature recovery networks that you might hear people talking about. That's why that's so important. So I'm going to stop talking and hand it over to Andy, um, who is going to talk to you about some of the amazing moth species that you will find um, in this area in the mountains. So. So I'm just before you have your brother, because he's left. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, it's because you have you finished it in that point? No, we can continue on. All right. Well, then, uh, it was just a question of when you were talking about the um, feeding on the marshes and uh, feeding on the nettles and the thistles, was it just the butterfly or was it the others? It's the caterpillar. There? The cat. Yeah. So, so we don't like to say that in the That's okay. Okay. Yeah. So in answer to that question, we talk about fade, braid, and shelter in terms of its uh, the moth and the butterfly to complete its entire life cycle. So fade is your nectar as an adult. Braid is the food that the caterpillar eats. So the caterpillar will eat the nettles and the thistles, then pupate. So that's that shelter stage that don't go mental in the winter and over tidy your garden because you will kill those cat, those chrysalis and those pupa. Um, so just really simple is like, if you're an allotment holder, for example, I know you get allotment inspectors that come out and give off about nettles and scrubby things like that. Um, put a little sign up saying caterpillar sleeping, you know, it's really kind of simple things you can do that will just switch people's mind around, just think a little bit differently. Um, marsh artillery, yeah, they, they, they feed on obviously the devil spits cubius. Um, and then the grilling, I can't remember what it feeds on. Do you remember? Uh, it's grasses again. Is grasses, it? yeah, because it's brown, that's right. Yeah. It's one of the brown groups, so different types of grasses. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, I'll hand over to Andy. You just click on there. Okay, okay. <laughs>
Thank you. Right. Oh, you can't skip through. Ah, that one. Oh, yeah. Skip forward. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I got it now. Yeah. So, yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Austin Butterfly. So, you've all been a victims of an enormous hoax, basically, because <laughs> there is no such thing as a butterfly. That's just something we put a name to. Uh, they're all Lepidopteras, uh, Rosie said. <clears throat> Lepidoptera can mean scaled wing or tiled wing. I like to think of a tiled wing. You think of the way tiles overlap on a roof. It comes from the Greek lepis for tile and terra for wing, so tiled wing. Uh, but yeah, the butterflies are just a part of the moth family. If you go to France, it's papillon for butterfly, butterfly and papillon de nuit, butterfly of the night for moth. I mean, it's just, and in the Germans, different, different cultures have different ways of looking at it, but you know, different cultures like putting different things in boxes. But I mean, sometimes I say it's like the difference, you know, between, uh, you know, the world's smallest hummingbird. Our bird is a hummingbird from Cuba. It can sit in the palm of your hand. And then you've got an ostrich. They're both birds. Or I was thinking when I was driving over here, it's like the difference between a chicken and a duck or the difference between a milk chocolate digestive and a dog chocolate digestive. They're all the same family, you know. It's like human beings, you know. People would think human beings from different parts of the world were all 99%, if not 99.99% genetically the same. Anyway. Uh, doesn't really have the same ring to it though, moth conservation. Butterfly conservation gets people more involved. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the picture I show all the time. You know, moth or a butterfly. I mean, people say, well, you know, butterflies are a particular shape. Butterflies have lobed antennae. Butterflies fly during the day. All these things apply to moths as well. You know, it's all these rules that people make up. They're all there to be broken because that's, that may not look to all extents and purposes. Show most people that. That's a butterfly, it's not, it's a moth. It's a thing called a large emerald. Uh, so yeah. You get day flying moths and one, so these are all real common things. I wonder, can I move somewhere? Yeah, so these are all really common things that, you know, if you're having a dander about, you'll probably see. Um, and that applies, applies maybe to most areas in Northern Ireland, although I would say that, you know, in your intensively managed environments, you're not gonna find these things, but you, know, you have things like uh, ragwort uh, feeding, uh, cinnabar on the top, so you, you do see the adults quite often. These aren't necessarily day flying moths, apart from that one there, but most of these, what people call day flying moths, you're actually walking along and you're disturbing them from the ground, so they're not necessarily flying during the day, but you're seeing them flying about during the day. Uh, that one there is a silver ground carpet, that's a common heath associated with, you know, obviously, heath that's in the name. Some of these things are named because of what the caterpillar feeds on, some of them are named because of what they look like, some of them have no idea why they're named in a particular way. Some wet moths, because you've got so many moths, um, you can tell that some of the guys who used to name the moths had fun with each other because you've got moths called the uncertain, you know, because, well, I'm not really sure about that one. Then somebody obviously named the moth called, back in the day when you could name moths, it's not the done thing like uh, these days, and to name them after your friends, or even the worst thing would have been to name it after yourself. You know, that's, ooh, that's a bit that's, uh, highfalutin there. But uh, you have a moth that's called, you don't get it in this country, uh, but it was called the conformist. And then obviously some funny wag thought, oh, well, I found a moth and I'm going to call it the non-conformist. So it's a, people have been at these things for you know, a couple of hundred years, different ways. Most people just went around and they would have seen these things, most you know, flying around during the day, disturbing them during the day. Uh, but other than that, you know, most of the stuff in terms of recording butterflies and moths, most of it would have been caterpillars, people looking for caterpillars. And then they take the caterpillar home. They find it on the food plant. They take it home with some of the food plant and raise it. And then they go, oh, it's turned into that. You know, and that's generally why an awful lot of them are named after, you know, the caterpillar. The cabbage moth looks nothing like a cabbage, but the caterpillars feed on the cabbage. Um, and then this moth here is a six-spot burnet moth. So that's one that you find really just basically associated with good quality grasslands. Same as that one there, yellow shell. I mean, the nearest place that you could probably go to see a six-spot burn it would probably be on the shore there. You know, you'll see them flying around uh, all the way down, oh, basically all the way around the coast, you know, Royal County down. Uh, Murloc, all these places are really, really good for seeing them, and Yellow Shell as well. Uh, most of those are quite common uh, if you're in the right type of habitat. Uh, some of them are actually quite rare. The Yellow Shell is an Irish red list species, so you have Northern Ireland priority species, which are the species that are protected in Northern Irish law, but then... Informing that is looking at stuff on an all-hand basis, and you have the red lists, and these will different things will filter in 
And actually, you would never have really thought that something like Yellow Shell would end up on a red list, but it's to do with the amount of decline. So it's not just about how rare something is. Some things were always rare. You know, you could only find this here and this here. But some species used to be quite common around, you know, in good quality grasslands, essentially. And now you look at the decline, it could have declined 60, 70%. That thing's in trouble. Like the grayling that you mentioned, like the wall brown, you know, a lot of these things are in big, big trouble. Uh, well, it doesn't like to play with me anymore. Oh, I know what I've done. If I click on that, yes. So, anyway. Moths come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, there's, I mean, they're amazing things. Um, I mean, part of the reason that I'm interested in them is that there's in Northern Ireland there's over 1,100 species. So when you compare that to around 30 species of butterfly, so say 34, 30 ish, you know, for Ireland as a whole, in Ireland as a whole, you have 1,500 species. So you know, I can get. I know it sounds really bad, but I can get an awful lot more fun out of moths because there's so much variety, and I never see them all. Never see them all. You know, and as many as you see, there's new species coming all the time. There's migrants coming. There's new species colonizing. Uh, so there's a species that you would see if you're walking around heathland areas. So if you're walking around somewhere like Murloc, because Murloc is a sand dune, but it's a, a dune heathland. If you're walking around anywhere up in the morns and you see this thing flying past you, it can be only one of a few things early on in the year. Uh, and it's going to be an emperor moth. Um, or it could be a, a, a northern agar or, or a fox moth. But generally, it's these things. The males fly during the day because the females don't need to do anything. They sit there, they emit pheromones, and the pheromones get blown along in the wind. And during the day, that's what you'll see. You'll see the, the, the male moths flying around. Uh, when you put out a moth trap, the moths are attracted to the light. So what you'll actually get then is you'll get the females because the females fly at night. They're the ones carrying the eggs. They're the ones with the next generation. So it's actually a more clever strategy. for you, know, for the, you can eat as many males as you want during the daytime, meadow pipits and all the rest. All it takes is for one male and then you have a new generation. But if you start losing the females, it all goes kaput. Uh, so the females actually fly about and start, a lot of these species, they fly around at night and they just distribute the eggs willy-nilly. Some of them are quite specific, you know, like the other moth called the orange tip butterfly, uh, but lays specifically on one plant. You know, the females will take the time to choose the right part of the plant uh, to ensure the survival of the next generation. But uh, some species just, ah, sure, it's a heat and will scatter the eggs everywhere. Uh, and then the other thing that you'll see uh, if you're out walking about is a uh, really, really distinctive caterpillar. I was almost tempted to say that's life size, but it's not. It's still a big, chunky caterpillar. It gets to about the size of your thumb. Mad, mad looking thing. Um, so that's that's one that if you're you know, earlier on in the year, sort of April, May time, you're out on a walk and you see this enormous thing flying past you, that's probably what it is. Oh, there's the female there. There's the female there. So that's the male. Uh, with the brightly colored underwings, and that's the female there. Uh, I hadn't noticed this appears in the front of uh, one of the moth books, the identification guide. And it wasn't until you know, one of my mates said to me, he wasn't interested in moths at all, and he said, that looks like a snake's head. And I went, hold on a minute, because if you were in continental Europe, or if you were in Great Britain, if you were in a heathland area, a dry heath, you'd be thinking snakes, adders, and so would birds. And so would any other type of predator. So actually, people always said, oh, this flashes the eyes. It flashes the eyes. And then things go, ooh. Or is it, it flashes the eyes because it looks like a snake? I think so. You know, it's a lovely piece of evolution that worked there, you know. Uh, so quite an amazing creature. Quite a big moth. Uh, really strong flyer. <laughs> it probably but Ah, there you go. So perfect. Perfect. Um, this is moth that you only read, well, I was going to say you only get really around here, that's a lie. Uh, County Down Stronghold uh, is this part of the world. Well, it's a really, really good site. I used to think this moth is quite rare, but actually it's much more widespread. Um, yeah, I, I, I have the thing there where I say uh, herbaceous plants. People always ask me, you know, what does that moth feed on? And sometimes you think, oh, I can't remember. But thankfully, a lot of them are feeds on a range of herbaceous plants. And you say, oh, well, obviously a range of, it's where you need a pipe in your hand and oh, well, a range of herbaceous plants. Um, that was one of the first moths that I actually really got interested in, you know, because um, I was doing butterfly transects at Murloc and uh, I kept on seeing these moths, different moths, but this was the one that stood out and only in a few particular areas and I actually didn't, I didn't even know what to look at and I actually had a wee notebook 
and a sketch to wing pattern. And I, I lived on the, I nearly spent all my life living on the Dundrum Road. So I walked all the way, I remember, I walked all the way up in the rain. I came up here in Newcastle Library and a copy of the Moth Book. And I went and sat through and went, oh, that's it. You know, and it was the moth, it's perfect moth book. It was Skinner. You know, you wouldn't expect the library to have one of them moth books, but hey. Um, but yeah, that's, so there you go. Here I am giving the moth talk, what, 30 years later, 25 years later. Um, really, really nice moth. Uh, the caterpillars are quite distinctive too. Um, I wonder, do I have a picture? Um, the caterpillars in this, and the, the similar, uh, that's the caterpillar. Uh, You'll see similar caterpillars about during the day and what people would call them, hairy marys and things like that. That's what people would call them. That and the garden tiger, ruby, oh, it's not ruby tiger, sorry, wood tiger, maybe not as common, but you would see them. And you see them walking across tarmac paths and they're on a mission to you know, either go eat something. Caterpillars just want to eat and then go to sleep as in pupate and turn into a moth, not a butterfly. Um, so you see them quite often, you know, uh, and uh, so I think maybe even some of them should be out this time of year. Um, but yeah, so if you ever wondered what they are, it's probably something similar to that or a garden tiger. Uh, that's the other one that you would see in Heathland areas flying around, much like the emperor moth. So you know, it's going to be one or two things. Uh, same thing, you've got, you know, male and a female. So this, it's what they call sexually dimorphic. The female looks different than the male. Uh, and again, it's another caterpillar. It doesn't show it up quite well, but it's another caterpillar that, you know, if you're walking up in the morns, it's something that you might come across. Um, and again, another big, big moth. Uh, really, really impressive creature. Like, uh, And similarly, you know, the adult moth, I mean, any bird that comes across that, the kind of birds that would come across that, I suppose, are meadow pipits and things like that, skylarks, and that's a hefty meal. But, you know, I keep saying, you find these things wandering about during the day. The caterpillar doesn't need to worry because it's hairy, because if you try to put that down your throat, it, it, the hairs would irritate. I mean, in much in the way that, you know, there's some species of moths we don't get in this country, but if you actually handle them, they'll, they'll put, bring you out in a rash. Oak processionary moth, pine processionary moth in continental Europe, uh, they actually get them in Great Britain now, and there's records of oak processionary, I think, in Dublin. Uh, so those caterpillars, you know, the adult moths need to watch themselves, and they, once you hide them in amongst the you know the browns of the heather, they can remain quite uh, hidden, and they're really fast, strong flyers. So you know, again, it's a bit tricky for a bird to get one, but the caterpillars don't need to worry. Although cuckoos like hairy caterpillars, cuckoos like hairy caterpillars, and they like hairy spiders and things. So that's they need to watch out. And then the other thing every caterpillar needs to watch out for is once it goes well, even in that stage, or even as an egg, as it starts off as a caterpillar, or when it pupates. Something might come and lay an egg in you. There'll be some species of wasp, there'll be some species of fly. And like, I don't believe in reincarnation, and that's nothing to do with religion. It's to do with, hold on a minute. If you start at the bottom, something's going to lay an egg in you, and you're going to go, oh, this is a terrible existence. And you're going to come back a level higher. You know, so you might start off as a fly, then you might come back as a caterpillar. Something's going to lay an egg in you. And it could take you ages until you get to a human being. And all the while, there's insects coming and laying eggs, and it'd be awful. Um, so, yeah, it's. Yeah, I'll be really disappointed if the reincarnation's real, you know what I mean? Uh, I'll be worried, in fact. Um, small purple bard, I mean, that's really, I mean, it looks distinctive. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny moth. It's, you get people that separate things into moths and micro moths, you know, big moths and small moths, but actually some micro moths are bigger than the macro moths, and some of the bigger moths are smaller than the, it's just too confusing because we're trying to put things into boxes and, Wildlife doesn't do that. It does its own thing. Uh, so small purple bard, tiny moth, hard to see. Really rare in Northern Ireland now. Uh, the blue dots, uh, well, actually, you can't really see. There's two types of blue dots there. There's a dark blue dot and a light blue dot. But as I say, the same thing as grayling, wall brine, and other species kind of retreated to the coast uh, or retreated to areas where there isn't intensive manage management. The only places that you really get records of it now are around Leighton Rodge. Uh, used to be a few more records around the moors. The thing is, it's so small and nobody's out really looking for it, that it could still exist, you know, just because it isn't in the same field that everybody used to look. doesn't mean it isn't in the, that field, that field, that field, you know. Uh, some of the people who go out looking for these things are creatures of habit, and you think, well, look over the wall. And no, 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 I always go here, I always go to this field. Um, but that's, people around the moths are strange. Uh, it's northern iron priority species, like an awful lot of these things that I'm showing you. Uh, but it's one that... And you look at the food plant, common milkwort. Well, I mean, there's plenty of milkworts up in the morns. It's everywhere. You know, it's absolutely everywhere. 
So why isn't the moth everywhere? But it could be because it's just simply under record. People aren't looking for it. Uh, then you've got a thing here as another strange thing. Um, not the greatest of photographs, I suppose, because of the light. But I mean, when you actually, the actual moth, it's, it's really nicely patterned. But I suppose when you put it on that background, you know, people go, oh, the patterns are so intricate. And some of these things really stand out until you put them on a piece of lichen or you put them, put them on a piece of tree bark or you put them on a leaf and suddenly they disappear. You know, uh, to our eyes, you know, when they're set in a book or somebody draws a picture of it, oh, that's quite distinctive. But in the real world, and actually there's quite a few moths uh, that look similar to that. But when you look at the, the distribution of it, I mean, that's more or less, I can't, I can't remember what the southern, it's more common in the south. But yeah, a Donegal distribution and then one dot at Attic Hall. You know, and that was just seen by somebody going out for a walk. And you have know, said, oh, yes, we've looked for it again. But I mean, that's what's the chances that you're out on the right day with, I mean, look at this year, the weather, it's rubbish. So it's out there, you know, and there is an old historical record, I think, from Stranford Narrows. Um, but yeah, it's a bit of a conundrum, that one. You know, it has to, it, it can't just be one, it can't exist as one lonely moth. Uh, and there probably is a population out there. So, you know, in one sense, you know, we don't know much about this moth, but we know that the Mourns area is important for it. Um, there's a thing that I found actually, uh, for a part of Sokiana, I can't remember the English name, tiny, tiny thing, smaller than your little fingernail. Uh, it's, what, it's what they would call a micro moth. Those dots on the map are the only ash dots. So basically what happened to that one? I'd said to my wife, why don't we go to Restrever sometime for something different to do? I said, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And then about a fortnight later, I said, let's go today to Restrever. I said, no, I don't go to Restrever. And then the whole way there, I moaned and complained. And I've attended this in my ears and was driving up, you know, into the Strever to the top car park. I was even complaining that the change in air pressure was affecting my tennis. I tried everything not to go on a walk. And then when we were walking up the hill, uh, we're going up to the clock more stone, actually. And um, there's a, just by the side of the path, there's this amazing standard libraries. And I just said, hold on a minute. I just said, do you know what? I'm going to stay here and I'm going to eat some libraries. I just stuck my head in the bush. I've never seen a crop like it, actually. You know, it was really, really heavy crop. And there were sweets, you know, really, really good. Um, I had my head in the bush and I looked down and I saw this moth. And it was really distinctive. It wasn't that one. It was a thing called, oh, I can't remember the name of it now. It was only the second record from Northern Ireland. And it had been seen a week before. And I was like, oh, and I grabbed the jar and I put it in the jar. And I was like, that's bizarre. And then I noticed all these other moths flying around. But, you know, I, I take a net out and I tap bushes and sweep for things and have a look at what they are. But I noticed that these moths, they would only go about that far from the library bushes. And then they would go back. And I swept a couple of them. There's a few birch trees about. There's another thing, a pot of spatulana and things. It looks quite similar to this. But I swept it and I looked at it and went, that looks odd. And then I, I took one home and uh, I looked at it in the book and it didn't occur to I was like, oh, no way. And then, but then the thing about it is, I knew what it was, but uh, I had to get somebody to actually dissect it for me to confirm it because well you don't know about that and I was like I know what it is luckily though I, I, within about uh, a week somebody else was trapping uh, in Wicklow Mountains in different places and they found it too so I just got in there by about a week you know what I mean I was quite happy with that you know I like these things putting Cody down on the map putting this part of the world on the map you know I'll get on to that later about Merlock probably but uh, but really I mean really 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 nice moth went back the next year and it's still there it's, there's a population it only occurs above 300 metres. So that's why nobody had bothered. Nobody, who else is sticking their head in the library bush at 300 metres at the right time of year? you kind of mid-June. Uh, so, yeah. One to look out for. There's another conundrum. Uh, that record's probably pre-2000. So that's Castle Well in the Arboretum. Only one record of that. Oh, I suppose if I move that. Yeah, it has recently been found. So basically within the last seven or eight years at all those sites. Well, it was known actually for Breenwood. That was a known site in County Antrim near Valley Castle. But you know, you can see that it's, it's regularly seen. So it's people putting out light traps and they're regularly seeing this moth. Put out the moth trap, they're getting the dotted carpet at the right time of year. Castle Well, seen once. Uh, it was a guy called Kenny Murphy and he put it on top of, uh, what do you call him, uh, Sean Harrison's roof. And uh, he got the dotted carpet and then never again. And Kenny tried a few times. I went down, put the top out a few times and nah. And it's there. It can't just exist. I can't even remember what the food was. The food plant, lichens. No shortage of lichens in Castle Wellen Forest Park. So 
you know, some of these things, some of these things come really readily to light, as they say. So whenever you put out a moth trap, you know, you get these things to come, and some things come what they call sparingly to light, as in once in a blue moon. Don't ask me why. Some things are strongly attracted to light. Some things are weakly attracted to light. They don't really know. Uh, but then maybe if you use a different type of spectrum, it just depends. You know, it's assuming that everything likes going to the same type of light. I just said that there's a, a range of, there's no such thing as a rule, if you like. Um, then this is another thing, Pyros Singulata. This is another one of my favorite moths, actually. Little tiny thing, again, about the size of uh, about the size of your fingernail. I can't remember when we found that. It was actually those two old records. I don't really trust those ones at Belfast. Uh, they're 1800 records. I don't really trust that. I think they're Carrick Fergus. Uh, it's not really, I mean, it's the food plant's wild thyme. It's mostly associated with sort of like, you know, June grassland. But um, there's a guy, Henry Hill, an Englishman, who used to look at micro moths in the 1960s and uh, early 70s. And he found it at Murlock. And then we found it about 30 odd years later. And it used to only occur in one wee small place. We always found it. But now it's actually quite wide, widespread throughout the site. So wherever you have the food plant, that's not strictly true. but. It's again. It's one of it's one of the rarest moths in Northern Ireland, you know. And that's as this sort of theme develops, kind of around Murloc, is that you find all these moths that occur nowhere else except Murloc, which is kind of underlines how important the site it is. Another moth, okay, maybe not necessarily a Morn's moth, but this part of County Down is a stronghold for it. Uh, you see those two wee dots again. That's Murloc again, uh, and out by Rathmullen, I think it's the other one. I think two thousand and twelve. Uh, but yeah, I get this every couple of years at Murloc and Moth Trap. Uh, no mullen nearby, but then mullen's one of those plants that can just pop up. Glass flower, like, you know, big flower spike, big tall yellow flower spike, about that right there. Um, in fact, that is called mullen wave, but it doesn't even feed on it, if you know what I mean. But it must be some association with it and nectar on it or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it's a sort of known from this area. Uh, those two wee unfilled dots there, you know, that's just because nobody's been down there. But we know it's in that general area. Um, there's another moth. And these are just sort of random moths that have turned up and found only in Morn. That one dot on there, um, not, I mean, that's what you call one of them little brown jobs. Like, you know, even I think if I had that in the moth trap, I'd probably struggle. Like, you know, for a while, I would have to go, mm, not sure. And, you know, um, but yeah, that's basically Carlingford, uh, Carlingford Lock uh, in the reed beds. Well, it feeds on ash and goose foot. So, you know, they're, if you like uh, salt marsh plants. So it's been recorded twice there. So if it, it is a lot of these species, you know, you can't, even species that people think are resident, they have wings, so they move about, you know. So sometimes you can think, oh, that moth, it's returned, it never went away. It, it could be an immigrant, you know. So a lot of the time you need to actually establish, is there a breeding population? The fact that that's occurred in Carlin for twice and nowhere else means there probably is you know, a population there. And you think, well, if there's a population there and it's associated with the, the salt marsh, well, what sea level rise, it's under threat. You know, straight away, a lot of these moths live in habitats that are pretty precarious, like, you know. Uh, what did I put at the top here? What did I call this? Oh, no, I don't know what, but these must have just been, uh, let me see. Uh, these are just moths that, uh, Hi, these are moths on the move, actually. This is why I put this on. These are, these are all moths that, you know, formerly would have been considered rare, but now they're everywhere. Uh, you know, left to right. Um, Buff Footman, first record was Trevor, I think, 1999, possibly. Uh, oh, yeah, I did write it there. Um, no, it's everywhere. Yeah, you know, I've had it up at McGilligan and places like that. It's in every county. There's a guy I know who trapped the site in County Tyrone. And he says when he went to the moth trap in the morning, or so it was an evening he went to it, you know, because he was going home. And when he went to it, he, he, know, he thought it was smoke spiraling out of it. It was all the buff footman moths. Uh, he reckoned there was about two or 3,000 of them. They're just spiraling. They feed on lichen. So an awful lot of these buffman, uh, sorry, footman species of moths, they've all taken off. Uh, another one I had first for Northern Ireland recently, I was kind of waiting on it coming because it was moving up the Irish coast. All nice and was dingy footman. So all these different footman species, they're really taking off. It's probably because our air is cleaner. They feed on lichens. So lichens like clean air, apart from some of them that like dirty air. But uh, 
So with the Clean Air Act since the 1950s, and because we've got, you know, we've went down leaded petrol, there's a whole raft of things that make our air an awful lot cleaner. So lichens do well, the footmans do well, white pinion spotted, another moth at first record, you know, what's that, 17 years ago nearly, 16 years ago. Uh, yeah, it's out as far as Tyrone. Um, Marble white spot again, Murlock 1999, all counties. And Thistle Ireland, I knew I had that 2012. I get it now every year at Murlock. Um, and then I got a record this year that it was, uh, and up until then, up until about two years ago, it never, it got as far as, uh, got as far as uh, Torella. And then it turns up in Rathlin. You know, so these things that, well, they have wings, but some of these things can really take off. You know, they can, you know, if given the right conditions. Uh, that's the marble white spot, uh, 1999. I don't know why I just, why did I include just one for rough that? Anyway, nice looking moth. Although, I'm sorry, I'm looking at this, but why it looks really good. And then I look around and go, oh, I can't really make that out. Uh, one of these, these are moths. What did I say? These are the sort of the moths that, from this part of the world that, uh, well, they're actually all moths from Murloc. Um, they're all moths from Murloc that were uh, either first for Ireland or first for Northern Ireland. Uh, and, um, and they're all of different categories. They're all things that occurred for the very first time in Northern Ireland at Murloc, but they all fall into different categories. So Elam Wainscott, when I first took that a few years ago, you know, kind of thought, okay, it must be an immigrant. But now, with more and more sightings down south, we actually think there must be a population in the South of Ireland. Uh, so that's probably what that is. It's something that's on the push northwards. Gold Triangle, really rare. The first one I had, the second one for Northern Ireland, only about, what, a month ago? And, ah, yeah, it was on the 13th of July. No, sorry, I had it on the 11th of July. And then 13 years ago, I had it on the 13th of July. So there you go. Only two records for Northern Ireland. But if you go to Great Britain, it's really common. It's amazing moth, again. Yeah, well, if you see it in the flesh, it's amazing. This thing here, uh, Crimson Speckles, that's continental Europe. Uh, that there comes from the tropics. So that could be anywhere from the Azores or the coast of Africa. And that there is uh, a moth I never, ever want to see again. Uh, I got that in 2012 after Hurricane Sandy. So I went to the moth trap at Murloc because, uh, yeah, I was sad. I was doing moth trapping in the middle of November. And uh, I went to the moth trap and I went over and looked at it. And the moth was on the, that moth was on the top of it. And I went, I have no idea what that is which was the best feeling in the world. And then when I went to the book, I went, huh, North America? I went, nah, I've got it wrong. And I went to another book, and, no, North America. I remember I rang the friend and said, um, need to chat to you about a moth I've got. And he says, oh, look, I'm busy. I'm in a meeting here uh, uh, with the Northern Ireland Environment Aid today. I said, he says, give me a phone later. And I said, that's okay. I've got a Stephen Shem. He says, I need to see that. You know, as the, it's only the, I think it was the sixth or seventh record for Europe. So that's why I never want to see it again. Because I'd never want to hear about it because mine's the only record for Ireland. You know what I mean? And I'd be so disappointed if somebody else gets one. Uh, that's the Crimson Speckled. Crazy looking thing. Crazy looking thing. Lovely looking thing. Uh, it's one of the airmen moths. Um, oh, I've went back there. That's a the thing that, oh, I don't get there. Oh, these are things that uh, sort of cut you down uh, coastal specialties. So, bordered sallow. You only get that at Murloc and you get it at Clark Point. It feeds on Rest Harrow. Um, which is a, a type of legume uh, in the pea family. Uh, really a southeast county down specialty. Shore Wainscott, another thing. So Murloc and possibly Clard as well, uh, but nowhere else really. Sand dart, well, that's the thing that's moved up the coast. You know, you sort of you see it at Wicklow, Meath and places like that, Louth. And eventually, about 20 years ago, it reached Murloc. Uh, the thing is, where are the sand dunes north of here? You don't really get any sand dunes. Apart from Clard, you're not really going to hit much in the way of sand dunes until the north coast, really. Uh, there's a really boring micro moth, but actually it's a thing called Bradtrofa desertella, and there's four records. All of them are for Murloc. They're the only Irish records. Um, and then uh, Portland moth, which is a moth. I'd, oh, well, I actually saw one in County Kerry last year, uh, but that was a moth that occurred at Murloc. Um, the last record was given as 1978, but actually that's the date that the people compiled the, the list. The last record was 1974. The food plant isn't at Murloc anymore. It feeds on creeping willow. So with the tide just constantly slicing away at the front of Murloc, you don't get that establishment the same way of that sort of foraging vegetation and the creeping willow's been lost. Uh, there's Bored Sallow, lovely moth. Uh, actually used to get it in, well, when I say Murloc, I'm, I have this thing where Murloc isn't Murloc. If you're from Newcastle, 
Murlock isn't Murlock nature's out of the National Trust. Well, you're not standing Murlock now, but uh, you know, if you go to the other side of Little, or if you're standing in the Steve Donner car park, you're in Murlock. That's, that's Murlock Upper. Murlock, the nature's out, is part of Murlock Lower. So the whole sand dune system, basically Newcastle's built on a shingled ridge. You know what I mean? This, all of this is built on cobblestones. And then as you get towards uh, the Sleep Donner Hotel, it's all sand, all the way right, right the way around to Trella. Um, so, yeah, I've lost my train. Yeah, Murlock. So, yeah, you're nearly in Murlock. Uh, the common butterfly annoys me, that, uh, Rosie pointed out, because uh, there's a friend of mine, uh, Marcus Punny, and his daughter had one. And it was 200 yards outside the boundary of Murlock Upper, which kind of annoyed me uh, because... Um, it's Mur Murlock's my main interest around here. You know, I, I, my garden on the Dundrum Road backed onto the Royal County Down. So, and it was Murlock, if you like. If you dug down two foot in the veg patch, it was sand. You know, uh, so an awful lot of the moths that you get at Murlock, I would have got them in my moth trap, you know, in my garden. So, for Murlock itself, it's the biggest moth list, uh, the biggest lepidopter list in Northern Ireland. There's 806 species of butterfly and moth. So, 23 butterflies and the rest, well, what's that? Make it 700 and, oh, I can't see the mass. I'm tired. I've written it down, 783. Uh, and there's three moths that you only get at Murlock, a thing called Caliphus Briana. I can't remember what it feeds on. Caperia Britannodactylus, which is a weird type of moth called a plume moth. Because actually the underwings, you can't see it here, but the, the feathers or the, the wings look like uh, plumes, like feathers. Uh, and then another thing called Hypsopigia. Uh, Glockanalis, I can't remember the English name. Weirdly enough, I may have had that a few times, and it's the only Irish site. Uh, so yeah, Murlock's pretty damn good. Um, yeah, I spent far too much time there, basically. And that's it. There we go. I've done. <laughs>